कमरे में Suscríbete a nuestro canal para que sigas nuestras transmisiones especiales. System. Thus, as I was mentioning, it is a real honor to have you here with us and to reflect about the consolidation of long-term caring societies because that is ultimately our goal, and to listen to your opinion on our city's care system and on your general insights about care and the care economy. So let's get to it. And I guess, Joanne, I would like to begin by you telling us a little bit about yourself and your experience as a feminist political scientist. Okay, I'm happy to do so. So I... Um... I'm I'm older now, and when I was <laughs> younger, it was at the beginning of the feminist movement in the United States. Um, I'm a first generation college student, a working class kid, and um, I didn't become a feminist until I became a graduate student. And suddenly, I realized how badly um, women were treated in the academy, how uh, left out of the political culture we were and how left out of almost everything we were. I mean, I was, you know, catcalled on the campus of Princeton University, you know, and I would walk a different way so I wouldn't have to walk past those young men yelling at me every day. This is not an unusual woman's experience, but it had a profound effect on me. So as I began to teach and think about, um, I'm a political theorist by training, and so my ideas have always been about, well, what can make the world better? And as I began to think about what feminists were demanding, I was a little put off by the middle-class bias of most of feminist thought. So I would tell my students, even in the early 1980s, here is my feminist nightmare, that what we'll do is free middle-class women to pursue careers that have been blocked for them. And working-class women and men and people of color will take over and do all of the work that women have been doing in the home that's been unpaid and unacknowledged. And I said to the students, we have to watch for this because this is what's going to happen if we're not careful to feminism. And guess what? That's what happened. Um, so early on, I began to make the argument that what we need to do as feminists is pay very close attention, not to ourselves and what we want, but to what women have contributed to the world and what has been overlooked of women's contribution to the world. Now, I'm a political theorist. Every political and social theory has an account of care, but the usual account of care is to say, oh, that's something to be done in the household. That's something beyond the realm or concern of the political. And that worked maybe for Aristotle, And that worked maybe in the Middle Ages, and maybe that even worked in some centuries past, but it doesn't work any longer, especially as women have been brought into the workforce. So as women enter the workforce, no one's left behind to do the care work. And suddenly we face care crises all around the world. And the way we've filled in those crises has been um, by getting people who are lower in the socioeconomic status groups to fill in by international use of migrants to do care work in, in different parts all over the world and so on. So my experience, so that's how my experience began. Um, eventually as a political scientist, I was able to write and write and most people in the United States don't pay attention to my ideas, but people in Europe do. And frankly, people in Latin America do, because Latin American scholars, feminist scholars, have really been leading the world in thinking about care in terms of domestic work and in terms of the care that gets done by actual people. So, I, you know, that's, um, that's what I'd say about my background. <laughs> Wonderful. And if you could tell us a little bit more about when Tell us a little bit more about your engagement. When did you encounter all the 
critiques of care theories and why, why did they become so central to you and to your work and how has that evolved during the years? Well, so there were no ethics of care theories back in the 1970s and early 1980s. And then I read Carol Gilligan's wonderful book, um, a different voice in which she describes the fact that there are two ways to think about morality, a voice of justice and a voice of care. And what's in, what was interesting immediately to me is I immediately saw this as a much bigger argument than just human psychology, but in fact, a description of two different kinds of ethical theories. Although the ethical voice of particularism of situated ethics had been pretty much left aside since the 18th century modernity by, um, by the, the reign of Kantian universal individualism, Kantian claims of um, if it isn't universalizable, then it isn't really moral. And that just seemed to me to be, it's very abstract. It's, it's very absolutist. And it seemed to me not to be a way to capture all of moral life. So actually, as feminists, we first had to fight to get people to even notice that there might be another way to think about and talk about um, morality and to think about the ways in which not just, you know, the big dilemmas of, um, you know, do you use a weapon in war, but the little decisions that people make every day about morality. How do you decide what's bedtime for your children when they're fighting about it? Um, those are the kinds of questions that are everyday morality, and everybody is constantly making moral judgments and moral practices in their everyday life. And feminists in the 1980s began to talk about the fact that those moral judgments also counted. And they began to notice as well that morality and politics can't be separated, that there's always a power relationship, forcing some people to make certain kinds of moral decisions, and other people don't have to face those. So Iris Young's work about um, the ways in which oppression plays a central role in defining what justice is. Um, until Iris wrote these words in the 1990, in 1990, nobody even thought about the way in which to say someone is oppressed isn't only to say they're oppressed, it's also to say something unjust is going on, that your theories of justice never reach. And so that's why I became so inspired to work on this. It's really practical. It really makes a difference in real people's lives. Fantastic. And I guess, Mayor, that's a perfect leeway to your question because Joanne was saying it's you became interested in this because it's a real way to make a difference, because it's a real way to address injustice and try to understand what's on beneath these concepts as people are oppressed, what really is going on. And I think, Mayor, what about you? How do you think these, how have you found these feminist theories inspiring or the role of feminism in all of this? And I guess I'll add a second question to that and I'll put both in, I'll package both in the same question. And how, how do you believe that it is important that we make of Bogota a caring society. Well, thank you so much, Diana. I am so pleased and honored to, to be here with Joanne and to have her knowledge and inspiration for our work here in Bogota. Let me start by an anecdote uh, that might, might be useful for Joanne to understand what our perspective here in the mayor's office in Bogota is. I came from the academy. I finished my PhD degree uh, from political science in Northwestern University. Oh, I was I was writing my final thesis, and even though I, you know, you can imagine how busy and demanding that is, I saw a class of gender and politics, and I say, well, that's not my topic of study, but I can miss that class if I want to become the first elected woman in Bogota. It will teach me a lot, and I decided to take that class and and, and to learn a little bit of it because I have to admit that even though I am the first woman to be elected in this city, and the first lesbian woman ever to be elected in this city, I'm neither an expert in gender nor an expert in diversity, right? 
Um, I'm not a, that's not my expertise, my professional expertise. Of course, I have a great love and commitment, but that's one thing. And the other thing is to be actually an expert. But guess what? After that, a year after taking that class, or, or a little bit less, I was elected. <laughs> I was elected here. And I said, well, I got to make a difference here, really, with my understanding of this. So why I love your perspective, Joan, on, on, you know, common day, basic decisions, life that have moral, ethical, and practical implications for millions and millions of persons, particularly women in the world. So I'm coming here from Bogota, Colombia. Colombia is probably, what is, unfortunately, one of the most unequal, yes, uh, uh, full of machism, of classism, of racism, that have marked our history and limit our development yes. in, in social, economic, and political terms. Half, let me, let me say my, my, my perspective in here, which is very practical, if you want to say but it have a lot of implications. Half of our economy, half of the jobs in our economy are informal jobs. Yes. It means there is no social security system ever to cover them. They don't have a full salary, legal, legal salary. They don't have any social security protection, right? They don't have protection for health, for the protection for, for children. They don't have protection for when they become elder. So what's the actual social, the actual social security system of informality in Latin America is the unpaid care work of women, Yes. right? And when you account to that, and there has been many, you know, brave women in Colombia who have fought for this cause to at least recognize the unpaid, the contribution of unpaid care work to Colombia's economy, it comes to, to be more than 20% of our GDP. I mean, if we were to pay, to recognize, at least to pay or to redistribute such an overburden of unpaid care work from women to society, it means redistributing 20% of Colombia's GDP. That's how big it is. That's how much the overburden it is. I mean, not, not even the oil industry has this contribution to our, to our economy, right? Mm -hmm. So I am a mayor. I'm not the president of Colombia. I'm just the mayor of Bogota. Uh, meaning I have no influence whatsoever in labor politics or labor economy or in social security network protections, right? At the legal level, right? I cannot decide being a mayor I cannot decide for a pension fund or a social security network. I cannot do that. But I can, I can be the first woman and not recognize this is such a great issue in my society. So the perspective we have in care, and there is only one country in Latin America has led this issue of, of, of putting a caring national system as a national public policy of social security, which is Uruguay. Yeah. And they have been incredibly generous sharing, you know, the expertise, the knowledge, the experience they have. And we decided in Bogota, we're going to build the first city, city, district caring system in Bogota, which at least could do this. I cannot change the, lab the labor market. I cannot change the social security system, but I can use the social services that the mayor's office offered to society so that we recognize, reduce, and redistribute unpaid care work from women to other members of their family in the first place, to our public institutions that can take care for the people they care about mm -hmm. or they care for, and third, to redistribute also to private actors to private actors that can assume this enormous overburden of care, of unpaid care work that women have. And you can imagine how practical implications these have, right? This is allowing, and, 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 and let me tell you this just to start, and then we, we can share another options. We decided we're gonna offer three basic services for women in Bogota through the 
uh, both as carry system. First, the possibility just to rest, to breathe. You know, there are millions of women, at least one million women in Bogota, who cannot even rest. They don't know what it is to have a free Sunday, a free day to take care for themselves. So the first service we offer, you know, as simple as it can sound, is just time to rest, time to breathe, time to take care of themselves. The second service is education. If we want to empower women, we need to free them from unpaid care work, to free them time to care for themselves, and to offer them, you know, better education, you know, to finish college degree, or to have at least a college degree, to open up more opportunities for them. So that's the second service, education services. And the third is labor connection, and, or income connection, I will say, more than labor connection. Income connection whatever they can do to improve their economic autonomy. Either they can work more from home and get more income working from home, or they can free time and become working in other place in, in the city. So these are the three services. And it has been you know, a little bit astonishing for me that I was thinking that the most demanded service was going to be education or income connection. That has to not be the case. Mm -hmm. It's time to rest. It's time to breathe. With has been so far the most demanded service in Bogota's carry system. This is such a huge thing. It implies to change our own services, to change the schedules. You know, we were, we were offering social services for women, no doubt. We were offering social services, you know, child care uh, or, or adult uh, care. Uh, but the problem is we offer that in times that are not useful for poor women, right? In formats that are in formats that are not useful for poor women, who are the ones who have more overburden of unpaid care. Uh, in institutions so far to their homes, that is not useful for them. And one of the most uh, probably useful services that we wanna build is not only offering the caring system uh, services in institutions, in public institutions, but actually going to the women's homes and taking care of the people they care for in their homes, which could be in many cases a lot more useful than having those same services institutionalized in some public service. So this is what we could do. Is not the best option? No, but that's what we could do at the city level. And we hope that we'll you know, motivate other cities in Colombia or in Latin America to have it and will push something that is a political fact, which is that the, at the national level, you know, the caring system can be recognized as an alternative form of social security in our society so that we can relieve women to have such a burden. That's basically our perspective. I know it is very practical, I know it, it may have many implications that we should take care for, but, but, but that's what we, we're trying to do here. And as I mentioned before, I'm not an expert on this. We learn from you, we learn from many people. I have to you know, be thankful for the generosity, enormous generosity that international organizations, you know, United Women's, uh, Women, uh, people from Uruguay, people from CEPAL, they have offered us, you know, technical knowledge to build these services, but you can be sure of something. When we left this mayor's office, Bogota is gonna have the first caring system. It's gonna cover thousands and thousands of women that are gonna be relieved at least two or three hours per week to take care of themselves. That's at least what we're gonna achieve in these four years. So Joanne, after listening to this succinct and wonderful explanation of what our system is, I can't help but asking you, how, do, how did you come to know Bogota's care system? Or have you heard about John <laughs> LeMayer's explanation? Um, which again, as I said, I think it's the perfect explanation of what we're putting in place. What is your general assessment of this system? What do you believe this system will help us to consolidate. Um, how do you think this, what is the role of a system as the one you just heard of or 
it might be an unfair question because it's putting you on stage and asking you if you're aware of our care system. But even if it's just a reaction to what the mayor said, what is your first yes. impression? How did you come into contact with it? Yes. So the first thing is after I was invited to speak with you all, I looked online and I thought, congratulations, I'll call this up because you've won awards and you won a grant from the UN to help you do this. Um, you've won an award for Open Cities for doing this. And it really is, as you know, I try to follow what care developments are everywhere in the world. And I've never seen such, a, such an innovative program. Um, I go back, of course, a little further because I know, Diana, uh, that the women's um, uh, division in the mayor's office has also done really innovative work. And this is the most important thing to do when you're caring. And that is ask people what they need. And it seems so simple, but it's never done. Everybody, all the experts think they know what people need. But in fact, as you pointed out, Alcadese, what people really needed was um, time to rest. And you wouldn't think of that if you were some man in a, behind a computer in some office, right? That you, you have your rest time. <laughs> but what's interesting then is that um, uh, women were asked, what do you need? And um, among the other things that you didn't mention that you also, but you know are important, women want peace, which is the partly rest, but it's also freedom from violence and freedom from the fear of violence. Um, and that's a really important piece of this as well. And, and the care districts may well be able to do more to intervene there on that front than they can um, elsewhere. It's um, yeah, it's very hard to do this as you started out, um, Madam Mayor, by explaining. It's very hard to do this on the local level. You really need a national level, a regional level, an international level to make these things, to really transform society, to be caring. But you do what you can do. And what's wonderful to me is that you focused in on the single piece that gets people thinking about care differently, which is time because people never recognize how important time is for caring and for everything else. We just have surrendered our brains to the idea that the more you work, the better you are, that work time is real time and everything else goes around it. And it's just a crazy way for human beings to live. And you're quite right too to point out, and this is another thing I noticed, I saw the buses, they're very nice looking. <laughs> um, it's very hard in a big city for people to get to public services. Um, I was talking to some friends here in New York who have the same problem. There are services to get discounted cards to use the subway system, but you have to go downtown in Manhattan to pick it up. And some people that's a two hour trip to go and then wait on a line. They can't do that. So it might save them some money, but they don't have the time to do it. So making the city available to people where they are within a 15 minute walk of their home. What a brilliant idea, really. What a brilliant idea. So I, I'm very excited about this system. Um, I don't think it changes everything, right? Because as, as the mayor pointed out, there are many things that still have to change. But what it does do is it begins to get us to start the conversation, as you said, and to put it into the political agenda of why is it that our lives are organized around work and not around what really matters, which is the capacity we have and need to care, be cared for and care for the others around us. So putting that on the political agenda is a really important piece. Yeah. I can see, Mayor. You you want to say something, Mayor? Go yeah, ahead. Uh, if, if I can, if I can ask a question to to Joanne, because sure. this is a sort of a actually an, an ethical dilemma. There are some studies in in Colombia. Um, as you know, we have a you know almost a sixty year old civil war in Colombia yes. that affecting in, affected in, incredibly disproportionately 
women in our country. I mean, as in any war, you know, mm -hmm. women and children are, are the most affected. Because of that, we have a, a lot of internal refugees coming to Bogota. Most of them women. And there are studies has, that have found this, this phenomena. Uh, that when a family came to Bogota, you know, fleeing from violence in some region, most likely the woman is gonna find easily work here in Bogota, caring for others, you know, caring for other families or something like that. Mm -hmm. So she's gonna be the first one to generate some new income for the family quicker than men. And the result has been that the more economic engaged and autonomous a woman, a poor woman begins, the more domestic violence they suffer and the more general social violence they suffer. It means, you know, and, and I think this is ethical because all this, you know, idea to empower women is precisely for them to have voice and time and education to raise their voice and raise their options for their own life, for new roles, for roles different from taking unpaid care work for others at home in their family. But what the studies in Bogota, and I'm sure this is not only in Colombia, things that may happen in many other societies, is that the price that poor women paid for such an empowerment and economic autonomy is huge in terms of violence. So of course, nobody will say, well, this don't promote economic empowerment of women because they will suffer violence. Of course, that's not the option. But this not, it's not easy, you know, how to, you know, get around this, this dilemma. On some, on some hand, you can say, and in fact, Diana works with that. For example, another, another political decision that I made here when I was elected mayor. I came here in 2020, and the first week I did a security council with the police members and all that stuff. And they told me, well, mayor, here is the, whatever, eight, I think it was, eight indicators of security every day, you know, homicides, um, uh, robbery and all this stuff. I said, well, do you have those indicators divided by gender? And everybody was looking around like, mm, they, mm, no, they don't have it. Okay, second, uh, do you have violence against women as one of your daily indicators? Mm, no, we don't have it in the daily record but we actually have records of that. So I made two decisions in the first week. First of all, any security indicator in this city will be to have divided by gender. I wanna know how many homicides from women are, how many homicides for men are. And you can divide it far by you know, age, that would be great too, because it's not the same thing. And of course, by geographic areas. So since the first week, we see every single day and every week indicators divided in these categories. So we can uh, agree on strategies and programs and platforms to take care of these differences. And the second thing was to see specific indicators to include in the daily report of the, of the city's security, uh, specific indicators of uh, domestic gender violence, and, and general violence against, against women. So you know for sure that my experience and, and well, Diana is a great expert of, also. She's also graduated from sociology and political science. And if you ask me along all the indicators of security and violence in our city, the one can be the one that can be almost predicted by an econometric model is gender violence. Yeah. or domestic violence. There are many socioeconomic factors that have highly levels of prediction of when and where and to whom such violence is gonna occur. Yeah. It's very demanding for our city because now we have the information. Now we know there are women in this area of the city of this socioeconomic income that will be 
will suffer more violence. But to actually have not only the information, so it's sort of, it's, it's, it's a tricky issue. Now I have better information, but not necessarily better resources to respond to it. But at the same time, we're empowering them. The fact that I'm here is empowering them. So the more we empower them, the more violence they will suffer and the more prevention and attention we need to take care of that. Mm -hmm. So it's not that easy how to get that around, how to, how to manage all that. So my reaction to that, that's a really important, really important point is, well, you'll notice I never say empowerment because I don't <laughs> like this word. <laughs> what will be the appropriate concept? Uh, well, the, the problem with empowerment is exactly this, that when you empower someone, often you, don't have dis power. you disempower someone else. Okay. And uh, as, a, as a person who believes in democracy as a root value, the real key is not to give some people more and not the others nothing, but to make sure they come up too. Okay. So the solution to this is, is obviously going to be, as you have already said, although it's very hard to do, is to change men's attitudes towards care. I mean, if the men could get those jobs doing the care work too, they would also be able to get jobs and not only the women would be earning money in their families. Mm -hmm. But men don't think of the care as something they can do and still maintain their sense of self, right? So another way to do it is to think a little differently about what constitutes care. So it, it, I used to say, no, policing is not care work, but I'm wrong, it is, if it's done in the right way. Yeah, if police is done to protect people from violence, to make sure that there's order, not to, you know, the police are so, policing in general throughout the world is very militarized. Yeah. I mean, it's really based on a military model. But if you based it instead on a model of policing as a kind of service to people in the community, and then you were able to give positions at a relatively low level, to men who are really in desperate economic straits, who would be able to have some public role as a protector of their community, they would have something else to do besides be angry at their wives for making more money than they do. Um, there's a, a wonderful expression, a sentence that comes from Sarah Ruddick's book, Maternal Thinking. I'll read it to you. Children, we could also say women, children are vulnerable creatures and as such elicit either aggression or care. And I think that's so important. When you recognize humans are vulnerable, people react to that either with aggression or with care. That's true. And, and the key is to get men to start recognizing that they should be responding with care and not aggression. It's very hard. But it, but, but maybe you can do something because you're <laughs> such a creative public official. Maybe you could do something about that. It's a really difficult question, but you're quite right. It is a dilemma, um, and you don't want to leave women. You don't want to leave people where they are. But on the other hand, you also don't want to um, perpetuate conditions under which men feel threatened so much that they resort to violence. But it's easy for them to resort to violence because that's what they've learned is their way of exerting or controlling or being in a position of relative. That's their form of empowerment. Don't want them to do it that way. And so that yeah, becomes that's the, you know, yeah. So that's, that's something important because that comes to, if I have to classify actually what the caring system in Bogota is trying to do. Yes. As I was mentioning is to these three services, right? Time release, to breathe and rest and education and income connection. Those are the services for actually caregivers, right? Yes. They are mostly women, but there are other types of services. And that's sort of the second you know, slogan of our caring this system is you can learn to care. Yeah. Exactly. You're, you're not, you know, you know, this is not, it doesn't come with the DNA. You know, women also learn how to care. It doesn't come yeah. within the DNA. So let's come to care. Let's bring kids. Let's bring your family, you know? let's bring your partner. They can learn to care. They can learn to cook. They can learn to clean. 
uh, they can learn to, to, to have time to read with their kids, uh, yeah. just to give some examples. And they can learn to do that without feeling less or more. Just it's not an activity, you know, that they should be able to do. So, so at least that part of the work, we're, we're at least having that in mind. It's, it's, yes. It's troublesome yes. sometimes to actually have the service, but all the pieces go together. <laughs> That that's what makes it hard. Joanne, we've been focusing on men and I think, right, what is the role of men? And you said it beautifully, men should respond with care and not aggression. So we're focusing on a key actor here, which is clearly men. But one of our goals in the care system has been to think about care in a shared responsible manner, right? Care not only seen as men and women and only within the household. So... What do you think about how can we make different social actors responsible of care, right? In order to mitigate or, right, or control contemporary risk, just this appealing to your concepts, how do you find what's the possibility of engaging, making other people responsible? How can we make in a practical sense uh, a greater push on that end? Yeah, it, it's a very difficult practical political question, because the truth of the matter is that many actors in society, including most social actors, have been able to get where they are by avoiding a re- certain kinds of responsibilities. Um, one of the thing, reasons I find the risk language so difficult to deal with is because um, it. It, risks are always about unintended consequences, and it's as if, oh, gee, how did that happen? How did we end up poisoning the atmosphere by burning fossil fuel? Who knew this would happen? Um, that who knew we could do something so bad that it would affect the oceans and the air? Well, we've known that for a very, very long time. We didn't know the details of carbon dioxide until the 1970s, but we've known for a long time that we've been doing things that harm the environment. And yet we treat this as if it was a risk that suddenly appeared separate from the actions we took. So one of the things that as a feminist thinker I've been trying to do the most is to talk about how complicated our relationships are with others and how those complicated relationships cause responsibilities. So private actors, um, employers um, who, require of their employees that they travel on their own time. Bogota is a very big city. (laughs) And and the time that it takes to get from one place to another is one of those uh, concerns of time that really makes it difficult for people to care because they run out of time because they're spending their time commuting. It's the same way here in New York City. So who's responsible for the fact that the poor workers live uh, two hours away from their job? Well, it's not the poor workers' fault, right? And so we have to ask the questions, how, who's responsible for this being this way? Or, and then how can we all take responsibility to make this, to solve this problem? And time in, time in the city is, the, is a really critical way to begin to recognize how these different responsibilities have been pushed aside or ignored or not really named. And once you begin to name them, then you can begin to solve them. Does that help um, to answer that? It's very abstract, but um, uh, the environmental questions are the ones that I think are so interesting here. I mean, I read an article written by someone who was published in Environmental Ethics that literally said that since we couldn't measure carbon dioxide till 1973, We really can't ask any country that burned fossil fuel before 1973 to take any responsibility for any of that because it was before you could know that it was a problem. And I thought, what? What kind of thinking is that? But you can see how um, if if your goal is to avoid taking responsibility, saying, oh, I didn't know is a very powerful way to avoid responsibility. And I think it is indeed the most powerful ways in which people, in which priv- people of privilege in, in a given city, in a given country, in a given world, ignore 
the problems of care that most people face is by, I use the language privileged irresponsibility. When you have privilege, you can be irresponsible. And as a result, um, you can ignore the consequences of your actions. And then when they get so bad later on, you can say, oh, those people, what's wrong with them? Why didn't they fix this? But it's the privileged who often have taken advantage and then just act as if, oh, I don't know what, where this comes from. Maybe that helps answer that question. It's a very difficult problem. We, we have to change the language, the language of control, of mistrust, of fear that now dominates our politics. We can switch that around and we can start talking instead about what does it take to care well for people in our, in our society? Let me pick up on that last sentence because okay. in a way you're, you're, and I'm redirecting this conversation a little bit because I want to address more explicitly your essay, your risk or care essay of, of 2020, right? Which is comparing the theory of the risk society and the ethics of care theories, right? Um, yes. And unless I'm mistaken, I think it's thought in a way from the global north. Right. And here we're speaking more from the global yes. south yes. and the particular issues of the global south. And the mayor was already addressing how Colombia is one of the most unequal societies from any perspective. Right. From yes. a racial, economic, gender perspective, from any. So what are, what do you think are the main challenges to consolidate caring societies in the global south? Right. How are these or said differently, how are these challenges different from those in the global north and the ones you've been addressing when seeing these different, comparing yeah. these three? Yeah, well, I, that essay was actually written before 2020. It appeared in Spanish in 2020. And it's writing about a theory that appeared before that. Um, and there I was really cranky. I was really angry about the trivial concerns of um, that Ulrich Beck was addressing in risk society. Because I do think that the real problems in the world are related to the relations of the global north to the global south and to, if you'll let me put it this way, the legacies of colonialism that live on in all of all of our societies. They explain why there's a global north and a global south, and why in every country, every city, almost every neighborhood, there's also a global north and a global south, right? So it's not just about the north versus the south, it's everywhere that, this, that these imbalances um, occur. So um, obviously, once you have more resources, it's easier for you to care for your own. And then to make the argument, well, care should be private, if you have all those resources, is the way to solve it. The, the old um, African-American feminist in New York City who didn't get published much because she just demonstrated on the street against the public television channel and did, well, she was an activist. But one of the, her expressions was, I'm well, close the hospitals. And it's true, yes, when you think you've made it, you don't have to worry about anybody else. So for 500 years, the global north has exploited the resources of the global south. And the people in parts of the global south who have been aligned most closely with the global north have done it as well. And those legacies continue to live on. Um, so the risks are different because, well, the risks aren't really different. The risks are still coming from the same source, which is that the people who have the resources don't want to share them. And um, there are ways of making money off of the harms that you do to people that are really um, com compelling to people who are already wealthy. The global arms industry in the world um, is responsible for a lot of violence. And yet there's never any talk about that as an issue of care, but we should be talking about that as an issue of care. Um, we need to talk about um, time and the ways in which, yeah, so even the, 
One of the things that's most disturbing about the relation of the global north and south now in terms of care is the way in which the global north exploits the care resources of the global south as well. Um, so throughout the world, people are moving to global north places, whether the actual global north or places like um, Bogota, where you can uh, import labor from the countryside to do the care work at an exploitative rate. It's happening everywhere in the world, right? That as care requires resources, you don't want to pay the real value of those resources, and so it's easier to exploit it. Um, the, the language I've been using lately to describe this is to say that the world is operating under a system of wealth care rather than care for people, animals, or planets. Um, because really, when you think about it, what we care about is wealth, and wealth generates wealth. And think of who gets best paid in society, the people who manipulate and make wealth from wealth. I mean, really, what is wealth? Why should somebody who's a financial advisor get paid more than a person who's a nurse or a person who's a home health aide for that matter? Why is that work so much more valuable? Well, because we value wealth. There is some value to wealth, but we've overvalued it to such an extent that we've distorted all the other values in the society. Um, and then risk is really about risk to wealth, not risk to people. Increasingly, if you think about it, when we're talking about risk, what we're really talking about is the risk to wealth, not the risk to people. Because if we were talking about the risk to people, we wouldn't, we'd stop wars. That would be the most basic. Yeah. Can I, can I make a question? Yeah, yeah. Of course, Mayor. Um, is that I can't I can miss this chance. <laughs> I, I think you are really, and this is not this is not on the slogan. This is not because I am a woman or because I am a mayor. It's, it's because I think it's it's actually part of human history. And I think the most the most important, the most transcendent cultural revolution of our time is the change in gender roles mm -hmm. in woman position in society. That's by far the most important social revolution of our time. And, and it, it started decades ago, and, and the more time passes into the 21st century, the more we're gonna be the effects of such a, such a change. And even though violence, you know, all that things that I were mentioning before, that's unstoppable. That's unstoppable. You know, the, the change of, of the role of women in politics and society and the economy in cultural issues um, is, is just unstoppable. So, Within that context, if, if, if we have to think or write about what, what could be in the Global South, a combination of a local caring system, a national caring system, and a sort of global caring system, what should be sort of the, the characteristics of, of, of a caring system at those three levels? what we should push to have, um, assuming, uh, assuming that, you know, whatever, in your context, in, in, the, in the United States context, you know, being a federal society and government, what should be the role for local governments or state governments? And what should be the role for the federal or national government in our case, if a caring system would exist at the three different levels? How do you imagine that? Yeah. I don't have a very good answer for that because it's so, it seems to me so far away <laughs> that I haven't really thought through all the details. But I think the most important thing is being democratic at every level so that the capacity of people to express their needs is always present and gets heard. So if you know what people need and um, are meeting those needs as well as you can, then if you run into a problem where you can't meet those needs, then the next level of government should step in and help you meet those needs. And the next level of government should step in and help you meet those needs. But knowing what the needs are is the critical first step. And it's the best, the local is the best level at which that can happen. Yeah. Because it is the level at which people are 
engaged in, in which you can see how people are living their lives. Maybe, does that help as an answer? Sure. Um, sure. I think what you're it's doing- It's pretty reassuring to what we're doing, Mayor. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know if it's from what we have and where we can. I don't know if it's the solution, but at least it's reassuring <laughs> to keep on going. Yeah, no, you began by saying that this is the first city in Latin America to have created care districts, but I think it's the first city in the world to create care districts. I don't know anywhere else where people are doing what you're doing. We're such a, you know, have a, a great listening to you. And this is just by chance, actually. It's lucky. It's lucky, but it's luckiness in the good sense. Because we came here and we have, you know, the, the opportunity to do our four-term year plan, you know, four-year term plan. Uh, but at the same time, we have the opportunity, just happened by chance, that precisely this year, we, we are in charge of doing the cities, the Bogota's master development plan for the next 15 years. Yes. The master urban development plan. So it's such a good chance because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be the first time in which we can territorialize, right, and include in the urban master development plan of Bogota for the next 15 years, the caring system. And we are looking at, we were last week, for example, looking at where the district cares, how the district cares should be distributed. How could we, you know, mark land that's going to be reserved a low price, at the lower price we can, to build, you know, the services that we're going to need in the future to serve better the women in our city, to connect them closer to the rail, you know, to the metro subway system, uh, to reduce, you know, Bogota is a two-hour city, you know. Yes. If we are, at least can make it a 30-minute, and I, I, I don't aspire to a 15-minute, but at least to the 30-minute city, that will be reducing by more, almost two thirds, you know, the time, the time of our citizens, particularly of our women in our city. So that's a great opportunity of connecting, you know, socioeconomic services to urban territorial organization of our city to provide such as services. And that happened just, you know, by chance, but it's a great, great opportunity. It is, and it's your foresight to recognize that it is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, it, because if you can control space and time to care, then, then people will figure out how to do it. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's a good, that's a good <laughs> perspective. Time and space. Which is actually the more, you know, the more competitive resources in a city, in any city. Yes. It's time and space. What is, what is what a city doesn't have? Space. Because by definition, it's very dense. That's what a city is. Right. right. And time. And time. And, and the worst uh, transportation system you have, the worst is the problem of time. That's right. That's good. That's good. That's great. I think we're both taking notes here, Mayor. We're saying, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am. I've got yeah, we're doing this. This is our way. This is our new argument. This is an additional <laughs> one. This is how we're going to go before the city council and everybody else. This is it. Yeah. Um, I know, unfortunately, time is running up. So I want to go in this last question. I want to go back to something very basic. I want to go something for everybody listening to you, and this question, I would love if, if both of you could address it. Let's go back to the basic. If you had to tell, not the f feminist economist or the specialist in care or the other very generous public officials who've been helping us around the world to build this and all our experts, but talking basically from a heart, from feelings, from theory, from wherever you think matters, for everybody listening to you, why should we care about care? Why does care matter for women, but for everybody else? Okay, I'll start. Care is what human life is about. It's what we do with and for each other. It what makes us who we are. And we live in a society where what matters the most is always on the margin and thought of as the extra. 
And if we thought of it as the center of what it is that we do, we would rethink how we treat others, how we treat the planet, how we treat um, the resources that we have at our disposal, and we would be able to appreciate our human lives and the lives and gorgeous beauty of the world around us in different ways and in ways that would be much more powerful than the ways we currently do. That's true for men, women, it's true for families, it's true for people who live alone, it's people, it's true for really for the entire planet. That's what I think. Yeah, I absolutely agree. But I think I was listening yesterday. Um, there is a podcast, it's a TED podcast, but what 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 make us happy? You know, there is a large harvest mm -hmm. study that for more than 100 years, they have followed people throughout their lives to see what actually made them happier uh, throughout life. And when they asked them, uh, when they were young, you know, they, they followed them for their entire lives. When they were young, they say, well, what do you want in life? And, you know, back in the 1920s or 30s, they say, well, I want to be rich and famous. And if you ask people today, they will say the same, you know, to the young people. Um, I, I want to be rich and famous. And what the study found is that actually when they get to mature life, what they discovered is that they were happier or not, not because they were rich or famous, some of them were, most of them were not, <laughs> but because they have worthwhile relationships. You know, uh, good relationships, that's it. That's actually good relationships uh, in, in, in within the family circle, within their social relationships, good deepen relationships. And there is no way to have good relationships with any human being without caring. You know, that's sort of the basic essence mm -hmm. make a good relationship a good relationship. Right. So I, I agree with you that it's so, so central, it's so basic to, to what our society is that is amazing that we don't pay the level of attention and commitment and understanding and investment to, to, to care as much as we pay to wealth, um, which is not that it's not important, but it's by far no, 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 have no comparison to what makes an, an individual life or, or, or a group society life uh, happy and, and worthwhile living. Well, Mayor and Joanne, this has been a wonderful and very enlightening conversation and reassuring, I must say. Um, a beautiful combination of academic and public policy work. I think the type of conversation that we should, that bears a lot of importance, especially in this new face, a global face. And Joanne, your advice and reflections will undoubtedly help us consolidate a long-term caring society in Bogota and hopefully beyond Bogota and to improve our city's care system so that more social actors are attracted by it so that care really is done in a core responsible manner and which makes us happier which makes us more empathetic and more connected in, in a human way and hopefully will make us do what we're aiming to do, which is recognize the importance of care and the importance, historical importance of care, especially care women. So thank you so much. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Mayor. And um, I hope this is just one, our first conversation, but that we have the privilege of continuing.